Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasts. Content warning ahead. This podcast contains very sensitive topics such as missing persons, unsolved cases, haunted houses, and paranormal activity. These type of topics can contain very upsetting, sensitive details and stories. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Misty Mysteries, a podcast in the business of bringing you ghostly spooks and chilling crimes. Today's episode, we're going to be jumping right into February's topic, which is strange and unknown, cryptids, aliens, odd and unsolved cases, and strange disappearances. We'll be doing this by covering the death of Rodney Marks, also known most famously as the first murder in the South Pole. This is a case that is truly kind of puzzling to me. But before we hear more, I want to introduce you to one of my podcasting friends. Hello, Spooklings. I'm Jason. And I'm Kathy. And we're the hosts of the weekly podcast, All Hallows Eve Podcast. We are a husband and wife duo with a passion for anything spooky, macabre, and true crime, sprinkled with our own twist of comedy. We explore topics such as the history of Halloween, the butcher of Plainfield, Hocus Pocus 2, urban legends, superstitions, and more. So come join us as we go down the rabbit hole that is All Hallows Eve Podcast. Listen and follow us at allhallowseevepodcast.com or your favorite podcast provider. Stay spooky, my friends. If you found that promo caught your attention, you can find a link for their podcast in the episode notes. Now, for the first murder in the South Pole. The first thing, as always, we need to learn about Rodney and what his life was like. Rodney David Marks was born on March 13, 1968 in Geelong, Victoria, Australia. He was one of the three children born to his parents, and he was a kid to brag about from the start. Rodney was extremely smart and excelled in his academics. By just seven years old, he was doing crossword puzzles with the assistance of his thesaurus, and as a teen, he received a scholarship to a prestigious private school near his hometown in Geelong, where he flourished in math and science. He then went on to study astronomy at the University of Melbourne, finishing his academic career with a PhD in astronomy from the University of New South Wales in 1993. Rodney was not only just brains, though. He was very creative. He loved surfing, the stars, and music. Rodney played guitar, playing in heavy metal bands. Rodney enjoyed just being a free spirit and breaking what others' ideas of what he should be was. One astrophysicist he met while at an annual meeting for Astronomical Society of Australia named Gene Davison described him as a bearded six foot two free spirit. He said he didn't look like a typical scientist. He had long hair and dress goth with black fingernails. He truly made an impression on everyone he met, making friends along the way. Everyone who knew him described him as being smart and a very passionate person. One thing that he was really truly passionate about, well, being an astronomer was stars, but also Antarctica or the South Pole in specific. His graduation thesis from his graduate program at the University of South Wales was about his special interest in the South Pole. In 1997, he was able to accept a job in the South Pole using the data from this thesis he wrote in college. This is definitely not an easy job or one for the week. Rodney was going to be wintering in the South Pole that year. Winter starts in March there and does not end until October. Even in the summer in the South Pole, it's only an average of about negative 18 Fahrenheit or negative 26 Celsius. But in the winter, it averages about negative 78 Fahrenheit or negative 60 Celsius. The sun also only rises and sets twice a year, setting in the winter, meaning that winters are sunless with harsh colds. No one and nothing is able to fly in or out during the winter. Those who accept work at the South Pole research stations for the winter can suffer from pretty isolating conditions. Anyone who is to go to the South Pole needs to go through plenty of physical and psychological tests just to ensure that they have a safe trip and time while they're researching there. Despite all of these criterias and challenges, Rodney did his first winter in the South Pole from 1997 to 1998. He was working on an infrared telescope called Spyrex 
There, he really got along with all of his colleagues. He gave introductory lectures on astronomy for everyone on base once a week to not only teach but help other scientists and other staff help and understand each other. He made time to hang out with as many people as he could and even learned French while wintering in the station that year. Rodney loved this and he loved the South Pole so much that he made sure to lock down another position at a second station from November of 1999 to November of 2000. The position he accepted was at the American station named Odmanson Scott South Pole Station. He was one of 50 in the skeleton crew to keep the station operational during the winter. His job was to operate an instrument all on his own. He coordinated projects for the instrument to be done remotely and collected data. His fellow scientists were very impressed with the work he did there. He not only made an impression with his work, but socially. Just like before, he made friends with others, and he was truly just himself. For the 2000 New Year's Eve party, he dyed his hair purple and played guitar in the station's heavy metal band, The Changelings, that performed for everyone. At this station, he also met a woman named Sonia Walter. She was a maintenance specialist at the station, and the two became more than friends. They even got engaged, and they really looked forward to getting married after the stay at the station was over. Unfortunately, though, Rodney never made it back home from this winter to marry his fiance. On May 11th, 2000, Rodney was walking between the research building and the main station when he started to feel sick. He went on with his day feeling sick, eventually meeting Sonia for dinner that night. To Sonia, he complained of feeling weak and he was having trouble breathing and his eyes became very itchy and dry. Like most of us when we aren't feeling too well, Rodney went to bed that night pretty early, hoping he would wake up feeling better, but he woke up feeling worse. Rodney woke up vomiting blood and decided to go see the doctor at the station, Dr. Robert Thomas. Rodney told the doctor about his symptoms. He was struggling to breathe. He had weak vision. He was fatigued and vomiting blood. He also complained of a burning sensation in his stomach and his joints. The doctor believed that Rodney was suffering from alcohol withdrawal and he wasn't too worried. Drinking and overindulging in these stations wasn't too uncommon, considering the isolating conditions and the outside weather. Rodney was known to drink and overindulge in it, but he was also known to have a high tolerance, and he wasn't known to be dependent on alcohol. The doctor's diagnosis seemed to get less likely as the day went on, and Rodney's symptoms got worse. He returned to the doctor two more times that day, each time his mental state becoming worse as he felt he was fighting for his life. The third visit, the doctor finally decided to get a blood sample. During this, he found two fresh needle marks on Rodney, which is another odd factor when Rodney's death is looked into. This blood sample, though, was for nothing. Dr. Thomas had a machine that he could measure Rodney's blood chemistry, but proper maintenance wasn't performed on this machine, and it was going to need 8 to 10 hours to recalibrate before it could be used, which Rodney didn't have. By the third visit, Rodney was full of anxiety and struggling to find any sort of comfort. Dr. Thomas made the decision to give Rodney a sedative to try to relax him. Instead, Rodney suffered what the doctor believed to be a heart attack or a stroke. He attempted CPR on Rodney, but at 6.45 p.m. on May 12, 2000, he declared that 32-year-old Rodney Marks had passed away from what he believed to be natural causes. May 12th, 2000 was a very hard day for everyone in the station, and it was only the beginning of the harsh South Pole winter. Rodney could not be buried there, and no one there was qualified to conduct an autopsy on Rodney. This meant that Rodney's body had to be stored in the station's storage, being preserved by the harsh temperatures of the outside. Rodney's death was devastating to his friends, family, colleagues, and fiancé. He had a memorial service in honor of his life, not only in the South Pole, where he was stored after his death, but in Australia with his family and in America. Those closest to him at the station even made an effort to build a makeshift casket for Rodney so that he could be laid to rest as best as they could under the stars that he loved, till months later in October of 2000, when planes could fly in and out of the South Pole. The first plane On October 30th, Rodney was flown out of the South Pole to Christchurch, New Zealand, on his way home to be buried in his homeland of Australia. Here, he sat 
till mid-December when Martin Sage, a forensic pathologist in Christchurch, was able to perform an autopsy on Rodney. At this point, his colleagues had settled with the idea that Rodney died from natural causes, but the autopsy revealed so much more. Rodney's autopsy showed that there was no drug use or signs of drug use found, but trace amounts of alcohol were found. Rodney seemed to be a healthy young man, but he had a huge amount of methanol in his body. Sage shared that the amount of methanol is approximately 150 milliliters. This was the most shocking news because this meant that his cause of death was from methanol poisoning. Methanol is commonly known as wood alcohol. It is an extremely toxic, colorless chemical with a slightly sweet taste. When consumed, and by the time that Rodney had seen the doctor, the wood alcohol would have turned into a fermic acid, causing the unbalance of pH levels in the body, which would lead to a long list of symptoms, most commonly rapid breathing, confusion, tiredness, headaches, jaundice, and increased heart rate, eventually leading to kidney failure and to the death of the patient. There are ways to treat this type of poisoning, but without a blood sample analysis, Dr. Thomas would have not been able to treat Rodney unless he knew Rodney had consumed the methanol, which more than likely Rodney never even knew he consumed it. These findings opened up a number of questions, all while his family was just waiting to get Rodney back home. To answer these questions, they first had to figure out who was going to work to get these answers. Since this happened in the South Pole, they had to determine who was going to take on Rodney's case. This was an American station, but it sat on the land New Zealand claims in the South Pole. The rule in the South Pole is that if something were to happen, the home country of the victim would decide. As an Australian citizen, Australia came together with American authorities since the station was run by America to allow the New Zealand authorities who had claim on the land permission to take on Rodney's case. Detective Senior Sergeant Grant Warmald from New Zealand Police Department was a lead investigator to look into the death of Rodney. He had four possible causes to look into. I'm going to cover them from what is agreed by Warmald mostly to be less likely to most likely. The least likely in the mind of who knew him and Detective Warmald was suicide. Anthony Stark, an astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and principal investigator for Astro, the company which ran the station Rodney was working at, said, I cannot believe he committed suicide. He had friends, he had a fiance. The work was going well and the instrument was doing fine. Everyone who knew him said he was a happy man, he was successful in his career, and he had a comfortable financial situation. And he was looking forward to life with the woman that he loved. As a side note, but an important one, we have talked in the past on this podcast about the realities of mental health. It can affect anyone, no matter how good their life may be or look. Those struggling often hide their struggles. It's important to check up on those we love, even those who seem to be very happy people. At times when someone is planning to take their lives, they may become happier. If you know someone who is struggling with with mental health or you yourself are struggling, please know that there is nothing you did to deserve what is happening to you and you are important. It's important to reach out to someone that is safe for you. If this is not possible, I will have resources for mental health services in the episode notes. It's important to remember when we talk about true crime, mental health can always play a part in missing persons cases or crimes, but this does not make their cases any less important. As for Rodney's case, it didn't seem like mental health played a factor into his death. There was never any findings of him struggling or reaching out for any sort of help. He also had a strong will to live when he became sick from the poisoning. Rodney sought medical attention multiple times throughout the day, becoming more panicked the sicker he got. This did not seem like something he would do if he drank methanol on purpose. It has also been mentioned that Rodney was a very good scientist and he knew the dangers of methanol. He worked with it often for cleaning purposes on the instrument. It was also locked up in a special cabinet and marked very clearly because of the dangers if it was ingested. Rodney would have known how painful and long death from methanol poisoning is. 
For these reasons, suicide was ultimately ruled out with not only the detective's investigation, but a separate investigation conducted by the U.S. National Science Center, or NSF, for short, since they were behind the funding of the research station. The next would be accidental poisoning. Since we know there are two investigations into Rodney's death now, one was being done by the detective at the New Zealand Police Department, and one was being done by NSF. The accidental poisoning is what seems the National Science Foundation favors most in the investigation. There are two main theories when it comes to the accidental poisoning. One that gets thrown around quite a lot is that Rodney may have been making his own alcohol and accidentally poisoned himself. The biggest argument against this theory was the need for Rodney to create his own alcohol. Rodney did drink and he often binge drank along with other colleagues, but he was not dependent on the alcohol. This wasn't something he needed every day. Even if he was dependent on it, which is a very real and validated struggle in these isolating conditions of the station, the station had a huge selection of alcohol that was readily available for anyone living or working at the station. Something I have considered in this is maybe he had a hobby of making his own alcohol, but even with this going back to what I've said a few times in this episode, Rodney was a good scientist. He would know the dangers of making his own alcohol, and I assume he would have done his research. If he did make his own, he was sick for around 38 hours. He saw the doctor three times, and others checked in on him during this time. At some point during this 38 hours, if he was making his own alcohol with methanol, why wouldn't he communicate this with someone? He wouldn't have gotten in trouble for it, and he would have known that this information could save his life. Him creating his own and possibly poisoning himself, though it seems to be quite popular on Reddit and other internet spaces, it is not favored by either of the investigations. The National Science Foundation didn't release any of the information that they found during their investigation, but one thing they did keep saying was how messy of a work area Rodney kept. Those who knew Rodney at the station said the same thing. His work area was very messy with bottles laying around. The argument here, which I do understand their reasoning, is that in this mess, Rodney could have accidentally consumed the methanol. It is a sweet taste. Although it still would have been a lot to consume on accident, 150 milliliters, that's about 5 ounces for those of us in the U.S. From my sources, I have also found that though methanol does have a very sweet taste, it also has a very woody taste, which is pretty distinct. There were also very clearly labels for safety reasons. This is one where I could see potential, but I also see the arguments against it. Although the detective doesn't believe this as much as the NSF does. The next one that the detective looked into is the possibility of prank gone wrong. This is one of the more simple ones because there are a number of pranks that could be done with liquid or drinks. Maybe someone put it into a drink when they were drinking together or snuck it into a drink at mealtime. Being in such an isolating situation with lots of drinking, I assume people played pranks to keep things fun and light. But most of those at the station were scientists, and if they weren't scientists, then they did have knowledge of what was happening around them, especially with the methanol, since it had been locked up and labeled. Maybe someone with the full knowledge didn't know the extent of what this could do to someone, but most adults, and the station was all adults, know the dangers of putting unknown chemicals into someone's drink. There aren't too many arguments against prank gone wrong, though it's not favored by the detective. In this situation, someone is responsible. If they didn't know or they knew the dangers, this person should be held responsible for what they have done. If a prank takes someone's life, it goes beyond a prank, especially when it comes to such a dangerous chemical and especially if they knew this chemical could make someone sick like this. Which leads to the last and one of the most favorable by the detective. This is that Rodney was the victim of murder. Now with only 49 people around when this happened, with no way of getting in or out, it seems that this should be easy, but it was far from it. The first challenge faced was the time between his death and when his cause of death was found. Rodney died in May and the autopsy wasn't done until December. That's a whole lot of months 
of cleaning any possible evidence in a place where evidence can't even be searched for due to the location and the company running it. I mentioned before that the station was funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, which conducted their own investigation into Rodney's death. The detective was pretty reliant on their cooperation to help figure out what happened to Rodney, and he really didn't get any of that. From the start, long before an autopsy was even done, they had already concluded their investigation and concluded he died from natural causes. So when the detective reached out to get information from them and the statement of the other 49 who were there, he pretty much got nothing and they didn't want to work with him. The NSF didn't start cooperating with the detective till 2006 when they agreed that he could send out a questionnaire to anyone who was working at the station at the time of Rodney's death. However, this was only on the agreement that they got to screen all questions and it was made clear to everyone that the questions were completely voluntary to fill out if they even wanted to fill the form out. Only 13 people have filled out that questionnaire, meaning that 36 other people that were there either didn't want to, didn't get it, or didn't have information for the questions he was allowed to ask. There has never been any suspects named by the detective. Many social media sleuths have questioned what Dr. Thomas' involvement could have been in Rodney's death since the blood analysis machine working could have made a difference in his survival. Plus, he has not been able to be found since 2006, which raises more questions and suspicion around the doctor. Others have questioned Sonia and his relationship, if there's any type of jealousy from either side that could have played a role in his death. The reality is that the detective is working with a very limited information and no evidence. And in September of 2008, a coroner report was released where it was said that they couldn't determine the state of how Rodney ingested the methanol, but only that his cause of death was methanol poisoning consumed approximately two to three days before his death. In response to questions about Rodney's death, Carl Erb, the director of the polar programs at NSF, said it's a tragic, tragic event and I have much sympathy for his parents and family. If the coroner had any reason to suspect foul play, he would have told us and we would have contacted the Justice Department. But we were ensured eight years ago that there was no evidence of foul play. For Rodney Mark's family, his father has been very open about the pain his death caused, saying, after so long, it's probably impossible to even know what happened, and if he died by sinister means or by accident, that's something that we have to live with. He does believe the NSF and the whole overall management system involving accidents or deaths in this situation needs to be addressed saying the overall management system and the way NSF behaved allowed this to happen. That's something that should be addressed. People will always find a way to do bad things, but things shouldn't have reached a point which someone could drink a tainted liquid. His father has also said that he believes if Rodney was American, this may have been solved. It's been almost 23 years now since the mysterious death of 32-year-old Rodney Marks. No real answers have come from the investigation into his death, but I hope that someday someone will do the right thing and help bring answers for his family. As for the National Science Foundation, they have made improvements on the station throughout the years, focusing on the station's medical facility where Rodney passed away. They have improved in ways to help prevent something like this from happening again, making sure the on-site doctors have more help from outside sources as well as the equipment that works. I do hope that they have heard and taken into consideration what the Marks family has suggested over their operations and how they handled this situation. A plaque was placed at the station in January of 2001 in memory of Rodney. There is also a mountain range in the Antarctica called the Warshire Range where a mountain has been named Mount Marks in his memory. Thank you so much for being here and listening to this episode. If you like Missy Mysteries, please check out all of our other episodes. I have an array of topics in the true crime and paranormal world. You can also help me out by leaving your review where you like to listen to podcasts or by suggesting and sharing the podcast to your friends and family. Please stay safe, stay hydrated, and I will see you next time for more ghostly spooks and chilling crimes.